Hello, I'm Kevin O'Connor from Madison, Wisconsin. I'm here today with my good friend Trish Connors, and I'm very honored and pleased uh, to be her questioner today for the Oral History Project of the ABA Section of Antitrust Law. Trish and I share a lot of uh, background and experience in, in state enforcement, state antitrust enforcement. I look forward, Trish, to talking to you about more of your background and experience in that regard. Trish is the Associate Attorney General of the State of Florida uh, and has a long extensive history in antitrust enforcement. But we'll get to that in a minute. First, I want to start at the very beginning. I want to start at the very beginning. Trish, where were you born and raised? Well, thanks, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here today, and thank you for agreeing to be my interviewer. It's a privilege and an honor to, to do this with you here today. Um, to answer your question, first, I was born and raised in, uh, in Florida, the first part of my life, at Patrick Air Force Base in Cocoa Beach, um, and we moved shortly after that, part of a military family. I have uh, two older brothers, and I was the, the youngest, the only girl, and we trekked all over the place. We left Florida when I was an infant. Um, we went through Europe and, and, and came back um, to the United States. My dad retired and we came back to Florida. So by the time I was nine, I was back in the U.S., but it was a fabulous childhood. You know, we spent time in Spain and England, and um, I was there during some pivotal points in history. Franco was the dictator in Spain, and even though I was four really? or five, um, I, re I remember the Civil Guard there and the big, you know, AK you know, guns and things that they would walk around with. It was kind of intimidating. And then we moved to England, and the Beatles were all the rage, and I was six or seven years old, and it was it was really a neat, neat time. And when we came back to Missouri and retired, I came back to Florida and found out that I was actually born in the United States. I didn't really understand that. So uh, so how old were you when you moved back to the States? Um, we w I, was, I was in the third grade, so I would have been, what, uh, eight, and I, we came back to Florida when I was nine, and I had the benefit of being able to go to school with the same people uh, from sixth grade on, which was was terrific. My brothers didn't get that chance, and they switched so many different schools. But it was it was good to be in one place for our family. And from that point on, you lived in Florida, basically. Yes, stayed in Florida, went to high school, Florida product of the Florida public school system, for what it's worth. And, um, then and where did you go to school in Florida? I went to, um, for, for college, I went to the University of Florida, uh, undergraduate, got a degree in uh, telecommunications, and then um, went to law school at University of Florida as well. You got a degree in telecommunications? I didn't know that about you. Um, uh, what did you do with that? Well, not much. <laughs> so, um, I, I really thought I wanted to be uh, behind the camera, and, and um, I actually enjoyed behind it. the camera, not yes. on camera. No, not on, on camera. Okay. I'm not. I'm not that fond of being on camera, but um, being being behind the camera was something I liked to do, and um, we did a lot of work. Uh, the broadcasting station at the University of Florida is one of the biggest public radio stations in the in the South, and um, we, I produced a lot of a lot of things for that um, news program and had some really neat interviews, like the Cypriot ambassador and the uh, uh, Eugene McCarthy when he, was, when he was thinking about running for uh, president again in the, in the late 70s. Oh, that was cool. an interesting interview. Um, but eventually, you know, I graduated. I graduated first in my class, um, had an opportunity to work for a television station in Orlando, Florida, which I did as the, their production assistant. And then decided, you know, I had to make a decision. Do I go back to school? I was 20 years old. Do I go back to school and get, get a law degree or do I continue? Um, I had an offer of a magazine show to do a 30 minutes, kind of 60 minute segment, 30 minutes um, on local television for $16,000 a year as their producer. For $16,000? <laughs> $16,000 a year. I hear the pay is about the same now. Yeah, it probably uh, is. Right, right, right. Um, <laughs> but ultimately <clears throat> I ended up uh, saying I, I'd had to go to law school. In the midst of all that, though, I did have a fork in the road decision to make. And um, it was 1979, and my one of my professors from from school um, had um, become acquainted with a, a, a TV station in Atlanta. So he called me and he said, you know, there's this 24-hour news um, program, or news station. Sort of that, like CNN? Well, or, it was or, CNN. Oh, it was CNN. Oh, okay. But he said, he said there's this 24-hour right. news station they're thinking about right. doing in Atlanta. Right. 
And you really should think about coming and doing that because it, you know it's it's maybe the next big cutting edge thing. And you had the foresight to seize that opportunity and, and I run said, with it. I said absolutely not. I don't see any I don't see any future in 24 hour news. I think I'm going to go to law it. school. So that was the fork in the road. But you never had dreams of being Greta Van Susteren on camera or something no, like that. No, no, not really. No, no. no. Okay. I, I like okay. more like Holly Hunter okay. in broadcast news. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> enough of that. What made you decide to go to law school? Um, well, I thought I'd, I'd had a professor in in, um, in in journalism school who was uh, very good on media law, and I thought I wanted to be the defender, you know, of, of media and First Amendment uh, rights and things of that nature. So that was my first interest. Um, but it, you go to law school and you start seeing a lot of different things, and I, I came out with a very different interest, um, but not sure what I wanted to do. I see. And what was your first job out of law school? First job out of law school was before I got my, well, before I got my degree, I, I managed to clerk, and I had a couple good clerking experiences, one with a commercial litigation firm while I was still in law school, and then um, with the general counsel's office for NASA, because that's where my mom NASA, was still living. the space agency. Right. Oh. Yeah, it was close to home, and they offered me an opportunity to clerk with the, their, in their GC's office, so I did that in, for summer, and it was great. It was really interesting. But um, after law school, my first opportunity to practice law was really as a law clerk. I, um, I, I judicial law clerk for um, an appellate court judge in Daytona Beach, who was a very well-known and respected judge. She was the chief judge of the of the court, and I did that because I really wanted to find out a little bit more about the law by studying it through the very court cases that would come through the court, and that would give me the opportunity to make a decision about what kind of law I would want to do. Okay. Did you, did you decide at that time to do antitrust? No, no. Oh, I, that I came had later. No, that came a little bit later. I ultimately went in to the Attorney General's office uh, through a recommendation of a friend of mine, did criminal appellate work for three years. Oh, okay. And okay. then went into antitrust in 1987. Did you, when you were in the Attorney General's office, who were the, were there any significant people there that mentored you or? Helped you along oh, your goodness, way. Oh goodness, yes. I mean, I've I've been very fortunate to have mentors all the way through. I'm I'm sure you have too. But um, I just had fabulous mentors from the judge I worked with to um, a gentleman named Ray Markey, who um, was was the pivotal criminal appellate lawyer in the state of Florida. He was the chief of our unit, and I was a young lawyer in my early twenties. Um, he was like a walking Westlaw before there was Westlaw. People would just call him, and he would. You know, knock out case sites and quote from, from um, text. You know, from memory, um, and he he was just fabulous. It, it wouldn't be unusual that you'd be reading a transcript and it would say, "Let's go talk to Ray Markey." When they you know they walk up to the judge, so that was a wonderful experience. And then, of course, we had some great attorney generals, attorneys general. Um, Bob Butterworth was the attorney general when I came on board and was the attorney general for 16 years. I was going to say he was there a long time. Yeah. I remember him. Yes. Right, and I worked with him for the entire time of his tenure from the time he came in, when I, which was around the time I was going over to antitrust in 1987, all the way through to the time he left. What, what kinds of criminal cases did you handle in the appellate division? We had a number of um, search and seizure kinds of things, fifth, you know, Fourth and Fifth Amendment kinds of things, but at the same time we, we were doing death cases, capital cases. There was no bifurcated unit that just did crim capital cases. So we, we handled a lot of uh, intense um, cases that ultimately some of them went to the U.S. Supreme Court and we wrote parts of briefs that, w that would go to the U.S. Supreme Court. So we had a very practice between state and federal appellate court. Um, I worked tangentially on the Bundy cases. Um, I had a couple of other uh, death cases that just recently have gone back up to the Supreme Court from Florida, and that was 20-something years ago. So what got you interested in antitrust? None of that sounds like antitrust stuff. No, and, and, and <laughs> it was all criminal appellate work or appellate work at some point, and I realized I was going to have to expand my, my uh, lexicon of, and, and get into uh, some other practices. So an uh, opening came up in the antitrust division, and I, and I applied for it. And how did that work out? I mean, how, why, did you, why did you move to antitrust? That seems so different than criminal well, appeals. I, first of all, I didn't know what it was, really. I mean, I think I was I, I was late 20s. I'd never taken antitrust in, in law school. I didn't really know what it was. But, but I had a friend who was telling me that this was a good move for me to go do this and get into more complex litigation on the civil side. 
and um, that they were doing a lot of cutting edge stuff and you should really consider it. It'll get you into the courtroom, you'll have opportunities to take depositions and do other things that you really don't get in criminal appellate practice. Well, so, how did you learn antitrust? If you didn't take it in law school and you just, now you're brand new in the unit, how did, they, go, how did go, you get up the learning curve? I go into the unit, there's only a few of us and, and there, were, there were terrific folks there, Jerome Hoffman, uh, Wick Heath, who unfortunately just um, passed away last year. Um, and a few other folks that moved, have since moved on. And they were all, you know, at very very points of knowledge and suggested that I just start going out and taking um, seminars and doing so things like do that. just do it. Yeah, just, just go learn it. it. Go learn it. <clears throat> so I went to uh, the conference board in New York, um, which was a, was a very advanced, but, you know, I, I, I realize now how little I knew when I was listening to that, that some of the scholars that, were, that always speak at that, at that program. And then I went to um, the first NAG kind of thing that I went to, National Association of, of Attorneys General, was in Kansas. And it was a program in 1987 that was being put on by the Attorney General of Kansas and the, and the Attorney General of New York, Bob Abrams, <clears throat> and the then chair of the multi-state task force, who was Lloyd Constantine. There were all sorts of people there, like the, uh, Professor El Eleanor Fox, and I can't remember everyone that was there. But it was a really interesting um, opportunity to see the complexities of, um, of, of antitrust law and start really understanding it, and to meet <clears throat> some of the real, you know, important people during that time, um, who were, in, you know, significantly involved in a lot of different things involving antitrust. What was neat about this program, though, was that it was celebrating a hundred years. I was going to ask. Yeah, a hundred years of. Um, of state antitrust, of the of the state antitrust law in Kansas, which happened which, to be the first state antitrust law. Right, the first antitrust law before uh -huh. the Sherman Act. Right. Three years before the Sherman Act, and and that was the point to sort of let people know that the states were very active in state antitrust enforcement, um, or any kind of antitrust enforcement before there even was a federal law. Well, what what, what were the first cases you worked on in the Florida Attorney General's office when you got to the antitrust unit? Well, again, it was very serendipitous time because they were working on a case that has been really the, the best case the unit has ever had in terms of evidence and, and, and uh, just amazing facts, and that was the school milk bid rigging cases, um, which we started in Florida. Can you describe a little bit about what, what the alleged defense was in those cases? Alleged defense? Um, that, well, that they, they really didn't have much of a defense, but, you know, they tried to in indicate that there was no conspiracy to... No, to alleged offense. Oh, offense, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. Uh, as far as the <laughs> alleged offense, it was bid rigging. It was simple, pure bid rigging. By local dairies supplying milk to schools? Yes, okay. the, the, local, the local dairies would supply milk to schools on a school milk contract, and there were various school milk contracts for each of the 67 counties, <clears throat> and... They would obviously be let around the same time every year because of the way the school season is set up. And ultimately, um, people would sit down before these bids, the, the, you know, the actual dairy processors would sit down in a smoke-filled room conspiracy classic kind of way and divvy up the school milk business in Florida. And we were able to crack it by starting with some smaller witnesses leaning on them a little bit, and eventually we had 18 different witnesses who could testify to different parts of the conspiracy around the state. And it turned out, if I'm remembering correctly, this, this had been happening in other states as well. It became a, a, a broader Yes, it did. When, as, we were, as we were looking at it, there, we, there was a panhandle, there was a conspiracy in the panhandle, and there was a conspiracy in the rest of Florida. The panhandle conspiracy, because of the processors served Al Alabama and Georgia and parts north of the panhandle of Florida um, got us involved in seeing the bigger picture involving those states. And as we got into other parts of the country besides Florida, we took it to the Department of Justice in Atlanta. They have a criminal office in Atlanta. And they um, took off with it. And I think it went on for about 15 years of one after the other uh, price fixing cases or bid rigging cases that they uncovered throughout the country. It was just a, it, inherent in the industry. How did you find it in Florida? I mean, what, 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 what was the red flag that said this was going on in Florida? Well, it was twofold. The first, the first was that we had Wick Heath. And, okay. and Wick Heath... Your former colleague. Yeah, okay. yeah. Wick Heath was, had an uncle or great uncle or grandfather or something that um, invented the Heath Bar. 
And oh. Wick came from a dairy family. <clears throat> he grew up in, I think it was Indiana. <clears throat> and he, he just said one day, this was before I got there, but this is lore. Um, he said one day, um, you know, I grew up in this dairy family. They used to rig bids on stuff all the time and pr fix prices all the time in Indiana. Um, <laughs> Maybe they're I, doing it here. Yeah, they're probably doing it here. <laughs> so ultimately, uh, he he got he just he took the bids, sat down with maps and push pins, because um, this was really before much in the way of computers, and played with you know maps until he was able to determine that it made absolutely no sense for someone to drive past four schools and not deliver milk to them to get to another one that they had the contract on. Um, and there was no business justification for any of that. So it didn't take long from there to start building a case. What were some of the other cases you worked on um, early in your career in Florida? Early on in Florida, um, School Milk was, was definitely the best one I ever worked on, and I really thought they were all like that, but they haven't been that much way, in that way since. But um, we did chlorine bid rigging cases. We did um, CO2. These are water treatment chemicals, and um, we had heard from procurement folks that they were concerned about the pricing involving bids on chlorine and, and So that one came CO2. from procurement people mm -hmm. in, the, in the state of Florida? In the state of Florida. Right. Um, we did a lot of outreach to procurement folks so that we, they knew who to call if they saw stuff like this. Um, then um, the, the next case that was really my case that I started working on when I had learned enough about the area was in the infant formula industry. We started... Um, what, what became known as NRA Infant Formula Antitrust Litigation. It was MDL'd in um, uh, Tallahassee. Um, but we were the first filed case after a two-year investigation, and that basically dealt with price fixing of infant formula products between the three manufacturers of infant formula in the United States. I think they coordinated, if I'm remembering the allegations correctly, through the American Pediatrics Association or something like that. They were all on the board. Is that... I remember that correctly. They weren't on the board. There were two trade associations. One was the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics. That's what it was. Sorry. And the other was the Infant Formula Council. So right. the manufacturers were on the council, and the pediatricians basically <clears throat> facilitated the ability of the, um, of the manufacturers to market these products like they were medical, they, that, that they were some sort of pharmaceutical as opposed to just being a food product. What was your tip off that? something might be going on collusively in the infant formula industry? Well, that came from um, a gentleman who ran our WIC program in, in Florida, the, the Women's Infants and Children's right. Program, which is a subsidy program for, for folks and provides vouchers for women, infants, and children in the nutrition area. Um, and he was talking over the back fence one day to our IT guy and just said, you know, I really don't like this. We're going to be going to a sole source bid, and it seems like they're not, they're giving us numbers that don't make sense. If there was any real competition here, uh, we would be doing better than this. And then when he went to the sole source bid, um, YF, which was the smallest market share member of the industry, came in with a significant rebate bid, which was so high that he began to wonder how could they afford it unless, you know, this cost nothing to make. Um, and real, in, in, in reality, it did really cost nothing to make compared to the prices that they were charging. Um, so that's when we first started looking to see how cost and price related in the industry and, and whether there was anything to the, the parallel pricing that was going on. Um, and, of course, conscious parallelism alone isn't um, a violation of the antitrust laws, but we dug deeper and found plus factors that clearly indicated to us that this was basically price fixing. Now, at some point you became head of the antitrust division in Florida. When was that and what were the circumstances? How did that happen? April of 1995, <clears throat> I became the division director after seven years of being in the unit. Um, my predecessor, Jerome Hoffman, left to become general counsel of the Agency for Healthcare Administration. He's with Holland and Knight now um, and recommended me to take his, take his spot. So that's how it started. And this was in the, the mid-90s when the NAG multi-state working group was in kind of its heyday, I mean, doing a lot of working groups, correct? Yes, yeah, it was right. very, very active. So what sorts of things, did, did, did the, your case composition change at all during the 90s, about the time you became uh, division chief in the antitrust division in Florida? It did and it didn't. Um, mm -hmm. Jerome had not been as, as involved, and neither did General Butterworth want to be that involved in multi-state activity. You were doing a lot <clears> of cases on your own. Right. We were doing mostly all of our cases were on our own, 
and we would be the lead in a lot of cases, which was new to us because prior to the early 90s, nobody would jump in with us. But Nobody as, in the other states, you mean? Nobody in the other states, nobody, um, n nobody in the private bar necessarily, and not necessarily, necessarily the federal government. We just did our, <clears throat> our thing, but there were, there, everything was changing in the 90s, so the private bar was becoming far more active. They were coming in and representing the commercial entities in cases like our infant formula case, or there may be even overlap between consumers and somebody else that we might not represent, that they might represent in, in for example, our contact lens litigation. So we were starting to see not only activism from the uh, private bar, but um, more activity from the states as well. Prior to the 90s, the states were focused on RPM cases. Um, resale price maintenance was, was the order of the day. It was a good consumer case to bring. Consumers were the direct purchasers. And in the mid-90s, when we filed in for formula, the other states took a look at it, but they weren't interested in joining us. They asked us questions. They did a lot. But it, it seemed like it was not quite what they were used to dealing with. So we did that one by ourselves. As we got a little bit further into the 90s, there were a few other cases that started popping up that other states were doing or we were doing where we realized, you know, we should be working together even though they weren't RPM cases. Um, and that was the insurance case, for example, California versus Hartford Insurance. Um, the closer real tying case that Bob Hubbard uh, worked out of uh, New York. Um, there were a number of cases. We did contact lens, and we were there for two years before the other states joined us, but they, they did finally. In that Jack one was litigated in Jacksonville, in as Jacksonville, I recall, right? In Jacksonville, and it, it went all the way through five weeks of trial before it settled. But but we did we did settle jointly with everyone. It was a global global piece with um, the private bar and and uh, and. Uh, the These were all states. before you became head of your antitrust division. This was division. all this was right. all going on during the time I become okay. the ch the ch the chief of the antitrust division. Um, what, what what were the main multi-state cases you worked on after you became chief of the of the Florida antitrust division? Um, I would say contact lens <clears throat> started was, before okay. and then ended after, and I was I was the person that negotiated most of that um, for Florida. Um, Nine West was one that we started. It was a resale price maintenance case that New York joined us on, and uh, that's one that, that that was done collectively with the other states. Um, we've gotten into pharmaceuticals. The first one we did, which Florida was co-lead on to negotiate. Um, with the FTC and and sort of on the side, the, the private bar, um, the Mylan Labs case <clears throat> involving lorazepam and clorazepate uh, attempt to monopolize in the interface between um, generics and, and brandeds. Um, then we followed up with a number of other um, pharmaceutical cases, Remeron, um, that, you know, any number of pharmaceutical cases you name, Florida was involved in some manner, Hytron, um, uh, Cardizum, uh, all, all of the ones that were going on in between, say, late 90s, which I think Milan was around 98, all the way through to now, we're still doing them. The last 11 years have been predominantly pharmaceutical cases. But there was the to Toys R Us case, there was Microsoft. Right. In most of these cases, was Florida actively involved in litigating them as opposed to just, you know, monitoring the, the working group? We, in most of, most of the cases, I'm not going to obviously take credit for all of them because it's, right. it's not true, but in most of the cases we were a co-lead or a lead or, and we had started several of them um, either slightly before, for example, the CDs case, Nine West and, and Milan were all cases that we were working either at the same time as or before the FTC. Right. And did, has, your, has your case selection criteria changed at all? Uh, from, say, the 80s into the mid-90s at this point? Not really. The cases have changed, but the how we select them hasn't really changed. Now how, do you, how did you select them, or how do you select them? We, we, we look at them from the perspective of the public interest. Um, are consumers deeply affected? Are public entities deeply affected? You know, are, are there monetary damages to be gained in some fashion that we can't ignore? Um, and is there strong injunctive relief that can be had? Should be is this conduct that should be stopped? Is it important for us to stop it? Um, and is there really anybody else doing anything that that would would moot out our uh, taking some time to um, to really look at the case and investigate it and determine whether or not there's something there? Is the criteria applied the same way to single state cases, a Florida specific case as? as it is to the multi-state process? 
the, I mean, the, the, the selection? Case, yeah, I mean, you, the case selection criteria. Is there some difference or what? what? I, don't, I don't think so. I, th I mean, it, you know, obviously every state would generally want to look at whether it's local or, or, or federal. If there's something not unique to their own uh, state, then they may not be interested in, in doing it. But some states actually do get more involved in things that are more overarchingly national in, in scope and not as not as local. I think that would be the only difference. Okay. Now, at some point, you got more and more involved in NAG, uh, National Association of Attorney General, um, uh, multi-state task force group. How did that interplay with your office during the, the 90s when you were division chief? Did it, did it, what, what assistance was the task force able to give you? What, what synergies were there, if any, uh, between your office and the, and the task force? Well, the, the multi-state task force really was an amazing resource going back to as long as I can remember. I mean, not Maybe we should describe what the task force is first, oh, just for the sense. listener who is not not, uh, not, uh, not educated, not, not as imbued with the history here <laughs> as we are. Well, uh, I leave it to other oral history projects to really give a complete history of it, but essentially it's been around since the 1980s um, in, in its present form, and it's a group of, of state antitrust contacts who are put together in a task force that, that NAG, that is affiliated with NAG. Um, we have a chair who usually um, is, is from one of the larger states, but not always. In, in your case, for Wisconsin. Uh, but um, that chair will stay for four or five years, help you know, develop a structure and try to keep a conversation going and a dialogue going about cases that um, are important for us all to be looking at. And we meet twice a year and uh, often have telephone conferences. But it's an important um, dialogue mechanism and it's an important resource for um, especially states that don't have the expertise in a lot of different areas to know that there's someone out there that they can talk to. But it's also important in terms of resources and investigation and litigation because I have nine attorneys in my office, but you know, with the task force I've expanded now to all across the country with people with different levels of expertise and different backgrounds who will take on different roles and allow us to then have opportunities to look at other matters that we might not be able to do if we were the only ones working a particular case. Now in 2001 you became chair of the task force, correct? Yes, around 2000, 2001. 2000, 2001. And how did that come about? Um, I was, had been working so actively in, with, with the multi-state task force and we had been lead on so many different things that um, it, colleagues started approaching me suggesting that I might want to do it and I really hadn't thought about it but I went ahead and applied. Who was your immediate predecessor in the role? Uh, Tom Green from California okay. and he, he, um, he, he had gotten a promotion and he'd been doing it for about four years or so so he stepped down I think it was October of 2000. And, and then I was interviewed and offered it in December of 2000. And you were interviewed by the attorney general that was the chair of the attorney general level antitrust committee in correct. NAG, correct? Correct. And correct. that was, that was Hardy, Hardy Myers from Oregon. From Oregon. Mm -hmm. oh, from Oregon, okay. And uh, well, let me ask just the overarching question here. What, what do you think of you as your greatest accomplishments as chair of the task force? Well, I so set don't, out... Don't, don't be too humble here. Too much. Come on. <laughs> I set out with... Uh, probably four or five goals and I think I, I accomplished all of those um, as to the best of my ability. One, one, was, one was to really set up a structure that allowed for more inclusiveness with, within the task force. And, and I'm not, I'll, I'll leave cases aside because I think the cases speak for themselves and I think we, we did a terrific job both in the merger world and in non world. Well, we'll have to talk world. about mergers in a minute, but okay. keep, you keep going but on, on the organizational stuff. But just on stuff. the task force stuff, the, the, the the structure was such that it was, you know, there was a chair and a vice chair and there were some working groups and there were amicus people, but I wanted, I set up more, more specific industry working groups, like in pharmaceutical, in the pharmaceutical area, in telecommunications, in banking, in health, there was one already in healthcare, but I, I really wanted to keep that one going, and many other areas so that people who have been the mainstays in, in certain states and know this stuff were part of that, and people who wanted to learn it and know it could become part of it. And, and then we would have the ability to monitor industries that were often in trouble with respect to antitrust and do a better job of staying on top of it from the perspective of having knowledge about the industry. In pharmaceuticals, for example, 
th there's a lot of knowledge you need to have. You have to know about Hatch-Waxman. You have to know about how the patent process works. So that, that, was, that was really an, an important thing, and it, it continues until this day. And our working group on pharmaceuticals is one of the most active um, under Bob Hud Hubbard's um, uh, tenure as chair. And then the second thing was it was really important to ensure a process in terms of certain things that we did every day in our cases. Um, we realized that people didn't always go and check, well, who is it sh that I should be representing in this case when California or New York or somebody says, this is, this is a case I want to pursue. The first question should be, well, who is it in my state that's been harmed and what do I do in terms of representational issues. So we, we set up a checklist for that sort of thing. So there were, there were a lot of different things that we did, uniformity and timekeeping, things like that that were really important to making sure we get our fees back um, in states especially that are trust funded. The third thing was um, uh, wanting to educate because there were very degrees of, of background and I came in with no antitrust background and found going to NAG meetings to be a fabulous way of, of learning about it as well as going to ABA functions which I did very early on. But many states don't have the budgets for that, especially now. And uh, I stole a page from the ABA and started setting up brown bag teleconferences. We had Judge Diane Wood as one of our early speakers. We had um, Meg Karen Garen Calvert, the the, the um, renowned economist, and uh, many other people uh, on on the phone giving short courses on brown bags for for states that couldn't go anywhere. And that's been developed wonderfully by Bob and continues to be a very popular thing for state folks. The fourth thing was um, state-federal cooperation was very important. And we had some give and take at the higher level of, of NAG and, and the Attorney, National Association of Attorneys General, but we didn't really have a staff level give and take on a regular basis. So I set up a group, a committee, that was comprised of state and federal people so that um, they would talk and even talk about what went wrong post-mortem um, about different issues that were important. The last thing and my most important um, thing that I think was was the development of an antitrust database that NAG now has on their website. It's a searchable database that shows, um, it's a multi-state database too, that shows what each state has accomplished to the extent they provided the information both on the local levels in state antitrust enforcement as well as who participated in what multi-state cases. So you can search on a state, you can look and see who's doing what. Near the end of my tenure, transparency was a real issue. People were saying they didn't understand what the states were doing. There was a bias against states in, in terms of they don't do anything. We all knew internally that we did, but we obviously hadn't done a very good job of getting the message out. So this, this project, I think, allowed us to show statistically and both and substantively, that we were doing a lot more than people were giving us credit for. Is this database publicly available? Yes, it is. And how, do you, how does one access it? You go, you go on, uh, I, I believe it's www.nag.org, .nag N-A-A-G.org, and look for the um, searchable database. I see. Um, getting back to the federal-state cooperation uh, issues, you set up a, a, a working group. This was a staff-level working group, not attorneys general, correct? I mean, that, it was eight assistant AGs talking yes, to yes. staff attorneys at the eight federal agencies? Yes, the FTC and the DOJ have liaisons with the states, but they also put some other folks on who don't do mergers and other things. So it's not just the liaisons, but the people that actually head up the merger units. Some of those are on this, this, this group as well. I see. Is there communication among AGs and you know, the leaders of the Federal Trade Commission and Antitrust Division, the top people there? Yes. And how does that occur? Um, what do you think about it? Well, it's called the um, Executive Working Group for Antitrust, and it was around before I became chair, um, but it's the high-level discussions that involves the Federal Trade Commission chair, um, the head of the Antitrust Division for the Department of Justice, and whoever is on the Antitrust Committee for NAG, meaning Attorneys General, or anyone else, any other Attorney General, Attorney General that may be interested. And then the chair, obviously, of the task force will go. Um, but what we found was when these meetings were held, they were usually during the Washington AG meeting um, in March of every year, and everybody's doing a lot of different stuff, and there's a lot of distraction. So the discussions are only get to the point of, yes, we're going to agree to cooperate and do more, but you know, there's no opportunity for real detailed discussion. That's why the staff level concept, I think, is a much better vehicle for those kinds of discussions. 
Now, as chair of the task force, did you you, you got more involved in the ABA section of antitrust law, correct? As yes. the NAG liaison? Yes. Why don't yes. you talk a little bit about what that meant to your leadership of the multi-state antitrust task force? Well, it was, it, I, I knew nothing about the role um, until I became um, chair of the task force and found uh, that as part of that I was to be the liaison to this council that, in the antitrust section. And that has been a fabulous experience. It's it, It's been wonderful to be able to interact with people from the federal agencies, from the defense bar, um, now from the international bar, and learn a little bit more about each other, both personally and professionally, that I think allows for a better dialogue when you start working on cases, whether you're on the same side of the table or not. Of course, also the educational opportunities, the opportunities to um, you know, exchange information and ideas and teach about what we do as state antitrust enforcers has been really a, a terrific. And the ABA has been really good in my tenure of putting us out there and treating us as equally as the, the federal enforcers in terms of exposure to the private bar and you know having the opportunity to talk about what we do. Now, you stepped down as chair in 2005. What have you been doing since then? If anything, <laughs> <laughs> stepped down in cha as chair in 2005, and uh, it, it's been really busy. We, I, you know, I mentioned Attorney General Butterworth. Um, he was with us for 16 years, and then he was term limited. Um, since that time, we've had two other attorneys general: uh, Charlie Crist, who is now the governor, and um, and now my current attorney general, Bill McCollum. Um, so I've worked with for two Democrats and two Republicans. I didn't mention Jim Smith, who came before um, Bob Butterworth. Um, and it's been a very interesting time. I, you know, under uh, Attorneys General Christ and, and, and McCollum, I've had opportunities to do more things. I've been with the office for 20, um, about 26 years, or been in state government for 26 years. And with this administration, I was given an opportunity to do more than just antitrust. I run the antitrust division, but I also now am the number three in the office as the Associate Attorney General. And so I do a lot of um, antitrust and uh, other enforcement kind of work, but I could be working on Indian gaming one day and doing legislative stuff the next and helping with the cabinet issue after that. So it's been very interesting. On the antitrust front, I've, I, we continue to do the same. I, we, you know, we're, we have a lot of presence in the uh, pharmaceutical cases that continue to go on. Um, we're the lead counsel in the Tricor case. Uh, Elizabeth Arthur is handling that for our office. Uh, Liz Leeds for our office is doing the uh, DRAM case. Um, Scott Palmer's working with um, with uh, uh, Elizabeth on, on Tricor. Um, we were heavily involved with uh, Texas and Pennsylvania in a series of insurance cases that followed um, the Marsh McLennan um, bid rigging settlement that New York got. We did we did our own cases on, on behalf of our own public entities. So, so you're still active in the multi-state task force even though you're not chair anymore. Correct? Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yes, we still work very closely together. Well, let me let me back up since we have a few minutes left here, uh, only a few minutes left, to a higher level here about what your thoughts are on you know, the multi-state task force and how it's changed since the time you became chair to the current time, and then perhaps ask what you, what you th see going forward for it. I mean, what, what were the changes you've seen in the task force over the last, um, in multi-state enforcement more generally over the last several years? I think that that's probably the better question to answer is, the, what's happened with multi-state enforcement. The task force has stayed the same. The people come and go um, somewhat. There's not as much attrition as people think, but the task force pretty much is fundamentally sound. What's happening with multi-state enforcement is is we're being pulled in a lot of different directions. There are a lot of cases out there. They're getting more complicated, much more complicated, which means they're getting more expensive to investigate. They're getting they're getting more expensive to to litigate. And um, I think that that's making it more difficult for states, especially in this, these economic times, to make a decision about what they should be working on and whether they should even be in a case. And if you look at the way the courts, at least from perception, are, are starting to weigh more heavily, at least that is the perception, weigh more heavily toward the defense and in, in some of their court rulings, the higher standards of, of proof that are, that are you know, being articulated by the Supreme Court and various um, places in the litigation process, that gives the defendants a lot of fodder to string out cases for an extended period of time, which again makes states a little bit more concerned about how far they want to go with litigation. So when they get in it, they're going to be very serious about it. I think the case selection is going to be 
narrower, but it's going to be focused because there's only so much that they can do um, now with respect to the length of time it takes to get a case resolved. Well, the changes in the case law and the way the cases are litigated, uh, are, does that make it more or less likely that states will join multi-state groups to litigate cases together? I mean, or, or are they more likely just to stay out of cases on a fairly selective basis because they don't want to commit the resources? I think the latter is true, but so is the former. I think the, la the latter is, is, is likely to be true for the short term because of the economy. But, but, but that doesn't mean that the former isn't going to exist for states that, that really think they, if they join other states, they, will, they can marshal the resources to get the case done. And remember, we can always invite in other states that didn't feel like they could afford to participate if we get a successful result. And how do you see the federal state cooperate, the level of cooperation between federal and state at the staff levels evolving over time? And how has it evolved over time since you became chair? I mean, it, is it the same? Is it, has it gotten better, worse? Is it uh, pretty hit and miss? Federal what? state? Federal state, yes. Um, I, think it, I think during my time, I know you have somewhat of a different experience through the history of Microsoft, but um, during my time, it's, it's, it's pretty much stayed the same because, there, again, there hasn't that, been that much attrition at the federal level either. So to the extent that we've started you know, to really get to know the staff folks um, at, at FTC and DOJ, and they are, they are the kinds of people that in, interact well with us um, and think it's important to interact well with us, I think, I think it's been terrific. Okay. How do you see federal-state cooperation going in the, with the new Obama administration, with their, the new federal team just now being put in place? Yeah, I, I don't think we know enough yet, but I, I really do think and hope that, that it will continue to be the same and that actually, if it is true that there's going to be more activity <clears throat> in enforcement from the FTC and the Department of Justice, that, that we'll be part of it and be engaged, and I look forward to that dialogue when it happens. I know that Florida has a long history of working with private plaintiffs' counsel, and in particular, I remember early on in my career that Florida had a number of cases where you, on calls, you, Trish, would talk about the private plaintiffs' counsel that were involved in cases that you were working on, whether infant <coughs> formula, school milk, and that sort of thing, and I learned a lot about that. Can you describe how that has evolved over the time you've been in the Florida AG's office, you know, the, the interaction with private enforcers, private plaintiffs' counsel, mm -hmm. I should say? Mm -hmm. Well, it, 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 it has a really quick evolution, frankly, compared to some of the other things we just talked about. When I, when I first did my first case with, with private counsel, it was in the early 90s, the infant formula case I mentioned, and they came in representing a completely discrete class of individuals being the commercial purchase, purchasers of infant formula like um, the grocery stores and, and uh, Toys R Us and Walmart. And um, that meant that we could work together, we had a common goal, and we had no overlap, and it was a good, wonderful. It was a wonderful relationship. I met some of the best uh, class lawyers out there: Laddie Montague, Michael Freed, Mike Hosfeld. You know that have all built tr tremendous reputations um, as private plaintiffs' lawyers. Then, then we moved into areas where we started getting more into an overlap, and they started becoming more um, involved and aggressive in their areas of um, of enforcement, and they would file litigation. You know immediately when they, when they determined that there was an issue out there on something. So it wasn't uncommon to start seeing them in cases where they were actually overlapping with us in terms of who we represented. Um, and often that works well, and other times it, it doesn't work as well. It just depends upon how enlightened the private, <laughs> private if the private attorney was enlightened, as enlightened as you were, Kevin, then we'd have no problem whatsoever. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. In other words, all <laughs> private plaintiffs counsel are not created equal. Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's all I have. Do you have anything you want to add to what we've been talking about? Can you think of anything? Uh, no, I just, I, I think this has been a, a, a very um, pleasant experience, and thank you very much for making it that way. Yes, I've, I've enjoyed myself, too. I've learned a few new things that I thought I knew everything about you, Trish. Now I, I, I've learned a few things. So that's all, that's all we have for today. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin.